This is Carl Ackerman, host of Journeys of the Mind, and we are part of that wonderful organization, Think Tech Hawaii, run by that mensch, uh, Jay Fidel. We have the most talented Sherry Nakamura with us today, and boy, is this a lucky interview that we ensconced. Uh, and so, Sherry, how are you today? I'm good. Thank you for having me, Carl. Oh, it's a pleasure. So, I know something about you, and this is you know, to get us to Broadway, but I know that you went to that wonderful Punahou School in Manoa, and then you went to UCLA. And my my question to you is, was it because of Punahou and, and or UCLA, or was it just your uh, desire as being um, someone, you know, sort of raised in Manoa by a lo lovely family <laughs> um, that, that got your interest up for uh, going to Broadway? wasn't necessarily Punahou or UCLA, um, but in high school, I did start dancing and um, it was jazz dancing. So I was a gymnast up until about ninth, the ninth grade. And then I transitioned to jazz dancing because it was the era of Michael Jackson and the start of music videos. So I was attracted to that. But I also sang. I was a singer. Um, so I did visit New York when I was 16, and I saw 42nd Street on Broadway. And I was um, very impressed with that the fact that these people were able to sing and dance and make a living at it. <laughs> so maybe that was the impetus. But it wasn't necessarily something at Punahou or UCLA that told me, no, you have to go and, and try it out in New York. So how long after UCLA did you make your sojourn to New York City? And how were you able to survive in New York City? So those are two questions. How did you, first of all, you know, what made you go there? And second of all, um, you know, how did you survive? Well, after I graduated from UCLA, um, and by the way, at in UCLA, at UCLA, I didn't study dancing. Um, uh, although I did find a voice teacher to just keep my singing up, but my dreams of becoming a performer sort of went to the wayside uh, because partly my family, uh, they kind of expected that I do the very traditional thing. And um, I majored in economics, so that made them happy. And I also studied Japanese language. It was um, part of the whole bubble economy period. And uh, I studied Japanese and I actually studied in Japan. So after I graduated from college, I went back to Japan to study more Japanese language, but I ended up finding a dance studio there that hired dancers from New York to come and teach, like I said, the Michael Jackson style to Japanese dancers. So I fell upon this dance studio and it was actually these New York dancers who got me inspired to go to New York. Um, I danced with this studio. It was like a dance company. We had these New York dancers who choreographed and actually a lot of them were quite famous or have become quite famous. And they were the ones who inspired me to go to New York to try to be a dancer. Um, it, it all kind of, I never planned anything. It just kind of happened. So the, the other part of the question, so, okay, you, you leave Japan, you go to New York, you know, you had to find an apartment. You know, New York has always been very expensive. You had to make a living. So how did you do all that? Well, I actually went with a Japanese friend. So at that point, many, quite a bit of Japanese dancers would go to New York to study. They could only stay for three months at a time. But because I was American, uh, I was able to stay as long as I wanted. So I did go up. I roomed with a Japanese friend. We got our dance lessons free uh, by cleaning stu the dance studio. So you had this exchange of dance lessons for free. But to, to survive, I had to take odd jobs uh, just to make the rent. So I would clean aerobic studios. I would clean apartments. Uh, I would do anything to get some income so I could pay my rent and also take dance lessons for free. So that's kind of how I started out. You know, um, your story, I mean, not in terms of dance, but it parallels the story of the great golfer, Parker Sawyer, who was on the PGA tournament. And he he used to, you know, in order to get on the links here in Hawaii, clean the, clean the golf courses. 
um, in order to do that. And you you clean people's houses and other places <laughs> so that you could dance. That's just that's right. a wonderful story. And so, um, where did you get your your first successes? Because you know you were a successful Broadway dancer and singer. Where did you? Where how did that happen? And um, were the were you know when you auditioned was it difficult? I mean, I'm saying this you know tongue in cheek because I know it was difficult, but how difficult was it? I was very lucky one day. So this was probably a couple months after I'd gotten to New York. I was waiting for a dance lesson and this gentleman came up to me and said, hi, uh, I'm a lyricist. Um, I wrote a musical. Um, we're looking for Asian chorus people. Uh, you must dance because you're at the dance studio. Do you sing? So I said, yes, I actually do sing. So he said, oh, why don't you come into the studio? We're having a production meeting here. The musical director is here. Can you sing us a song? So I said, sure, I'll sing you I Have Dreamed from the King and I. <laughs> I just so happened to know that. And um, they heard me and then they watched me dance in the dance class. And I was hired for a professional musical. So this is the catch 22 when you get to New York. Uh, a professional musical is one that is sponsored by the Actors' Equity Association. It's the Actors' Union. And usually for auditions, if you don't, if you're not part of the Actors' Equity Union, you can't audition. Um, so I was lucky enough to get hired to be in this professional show. So after the show ended, I was able to go back to New York with my equity card, and now I could audition for professional musical. So that was really fortuitous for me. Uh, not only that, um, I was in the chorus, right? So I was singing and dancing, but the principal actors in this show, which which was in Connecticut, so it was like a it was at a theater called Goodspeed, which is actually where Annie started. So some of these Broadway shows are started at Goodspeed uh, in in uh, Connecticut. Um, but the principal actors in my show had been on Broadway. So of course, I was very inquisitive when I started. I asked a ton of questions. You know, what do I need to do when I go back to New York when the show ends? What do you suggest? And they did give me good advice. You know, they told me, you love to dance, but um, you should take some voice lessons and work on your singing and you should get into acting class. So they gave me a lot of advice. And I think throughout my whole process in New York, I kept asking questions and learning and and tried to constantly improve and be better. You must have been very good with your finances um, <laughs> in terms of, because you just mentioned like three different types of classes that you had to right. take. So I, I'm sure that those were costly, especially in New York City. So you must have, you must have been a saver and not spending much money on anything except for trying to get, you know, um, gigs in the um, dancing and, and voice fields. Well, yes, I lived with many roommates. I would walk instead of catching the bus or subway. Uh, I think I even became a vegetarian for a while because I had to save on food. So it was a struggle, but um, strangely, it didn't seem like a struggle because you were pursuing your passion. And there was kind of a goal. I mean, when I started auditioning, when I went back to New York after this Connecticut show, I auditioned for a lot of things, open audition, uh, and I did have my equity card. So you learn quickly what you need to do in order to even be considered, you have to be good enough. Um, you have to have a certain level of, of skill. And uh, fortunately for me, I was a singer and a dancer. I wasn't spectacular at, at either. I was satisfactory at both. So I could go to a singer's call. And if I passed, they would watch me dance or vice versa. But I also knew if it was something that was too difficult for me. Um, I would know next time, you know, it, it's just too hard. I, I, I shouldn't even, I shouldn't waste my time. So you come to learn what you think you could get hired for. And also at the same time, working on the skill. And yes, lessons are expensive. New York was expensive. It's probably way more expensive today, but um, you have to manage to survive. And yeah, I mean, it was good life lessons learned. Let me ask you something about your editions, because you mentioned those. And so can you think of two different editions? One you went to and you didn't get in and was, were disappointed. And another one where you were successful. Can you describe those experiences? I think it was an audition for West Side Story, which is um, the dancing is extremely difficult. 
um, I remember, so they put you, right, they, they, sh they uh, have you check in and then they put you into groups and then you're sort of shuffled into a room, maybe six at a time and you're given a number and they show you the choreography um, and you're expected to learn it right then and there. I, it was extremely difficult and I knew it was too much for me. I mean, you try the best you can, um, but that feeling of, yeah, that feeling of having to be too hard is extremely stressful. And, and you know, the five minutes seems like five hours. Um, but then you have to chalk it up and you say, well, I know now that that's a show that maybe it's too tough for me. But that feeling, that sort of sinking feeling um, does uh, make you, you know, it makes you, it makes you tough. Um, on the other hand, um, there have been occasions where um, it has been successful. So this was actually the musical for Shogun. Uh, there was actually a musical uh, Shogun, which was <laughs> exactly a success on Broadway, but it was a Broadway show. And I did this uh, audition solo. Um, they were needing um, people and they had hired some people, but I was called in at an individual appointment. And um, the assistant director, I didn't know this, but he, he was once a principal dancer at the American Ballet Theater. Um, but I didn't know this. And he gave me a ballet combination and I'm all by myself. Um, and, you know, you just go for it. And I remember doing it. And I remember, I remember his affirmation, like telling me, okay, that's good. That's good. And um, consequently, I did get hired. So, you know, you get redeemed uh, at in certain instances and you, you, you learn to accept sort of defeat in other instances. You know, one of the things that if you go to New York, you, you know, people are not always smiling and they're moving very fast. <laughs> and, and this is probably your case because you're probably going from the theater to um, to a job or you're going from the theater or a job home so you could sleep for a while before you got up and, apply, you know, audition for another play or audition for another um, um, either dancing or a voice part. My question to you is, you know, this is not the style in your home area, Hawaii, where people are pretty slow walking and um, are, are generally very friendly and are wearing the, the kind of garb I'm wearing today, which is, you know, a Aloha shirt. And, um, and so my question to you, how did you adjust um, to the culture? And also you went to school in another kind of laid back, you know, beach community, even <laughs> though UCLA is probably one of the best um, Public, well, it is one of the best public institutions, not only in the United States, but in the world. So how did you adjust? I mean, I, of course, you were in Tokyo, which is much like New York, but um, but uh, how did you adjust? Living in Tokyo uh, and living in New York, you if you're if you're there and you're living there, you kind of have to do like they do. And so I think I did. Um, like a chameleon, right? You adjust to your environment. And what I learned about New York um, is that people are very uh, direct, but they're very honest. And um, for the most part, they mean well. Uh, occasionally you will get to, you will meet people who don't mean well, but um, so for example, like feedback, right? You know that they're giving you the truth if they tell you something that's good or something that's not good. So I really appreciated that. Um, it is fast paced. It is extremely competitive in the, in the entertainment industry. And, um, you know, there are times when it, you just feel like you want to go home and cry. <laughs> but um, on the other hand, when you do just like, um, I was ex explaining when when you have a good audition or when you when you do something creative that you don't expect, um, you 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 feel validated. But yes, it does take adjusting. It takes um, understanding where people are coming from, um, and it's and it's also dealing with people you're working with. You you have to be adaptable to 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 where you are and what circumstances you're in. That brings up a point. I mean, you just brought it up. You know, so when you're uh, um, working in Shogun or you were working in another one of your um, successes um, in terms of Broadway, what was that like? I mean, what was it like? Because, you know, I mean, generally these things don't go off except for one day a week. And so you're pretty darn busy. So what was your life like then? 
Yeah, well, I remember when I first got to New York and I was walking uh, down Broadway and I went, came to the Broadway theater. And at that time, it was Les Miserables, blah, that was um, playing at the Broadway theater. It's called the Broadway theater, which is 53rd and Broadway. I remember looking at the um, photos um, in the front um, where the, the, the entrance was. And I remember thinking, wow, this is like fantastic, you know? What a show. And then I, th then I thought to myself, well, I'll never be able to afford going to this show, but it, it's, 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 it's wonderful. Um, well, a few years later, I was at that same theater uh, performing in it. And I was going into the um, backstage door and checking in. Um, and it, it's funny because you take it for granted, I think, when you're in it. Uh, only now that I can reflect back that, you know, I had been outside and thinking, oh, this is just a wonderful thing. And then a few years later, I was right at that theater, <laughs> going through the backstage door and checking in to, to, to go to work. So it is busy. You, you perform eight times a week. You have shows every night except Sunday, I think it was, and then two matinees on Wednesday and Saturday. Plus, you're constantly trying to get other jobs. You're auditioning for commercials and uh, soap operas or movies or TV shows or print work or, you know, you, your agent calls you and says, can you do this, this, and, you know, can you go to this audition? So meanwhile, you're trying to keep up your, your craft. So it is a very busy life. Um, and the performing is taxing. Um, and unfortunately, over time, it does, it can become just like another job. But I think you have to keep reminding yourself that not very many people have the opportunity to, to do this. So you, it puts you back in your place like, I have this opportunity. It's a privilege. And I'm going to do my best. And I'm going to keep working to improve my craft. And you keep going that way. That said, you have many, many, many disappointments. You get rejected at more auditions way more auditions than you get accepted for the job. Sometimes people don't treat you very nicely, so you have to just brush it off. It is of an it's an up and down kind of emotional roller coaster at times. Um, when uh, Miss Saigon was uh, actually announcing the final cast, I wasn't chosen to be one of the original cast. I did join the show six months after it opened, but that disappointment was just so tremendous, right? Because you're anticipating having a chance to to be part of this original show. And uh, so, you know, your emotions go up and down. So it it it, it takes a lot to, to try to manage all of that. But um, I'm so glad that I had that opportunity. And not only did I grow as an individual, but I grew and I was exposed to art. And that um, I, nobody, I would have never had that opportunity or chance to to learn in that kind of atmosphere. Okay, so you're working on Miss Saigon. Yep. And um, you joined you've joined the group, which is probably already well formulated. So, right. what was it like interacting with the other dancers, singers, stars, etc. in Miss Saigon? Well, you all become again. I was a ensemble. I was in the chorus, and the chorus is somewhat separate from the principal actors. You're in a different area. Um, but yes, you are trying to make art through this production. So part of it is understanding what you have to do in your position. But part of it is you have to interact with whoever you're with on stage. So you do your best to uh, uh, make that adjustment. But of course, the show is so busy. And so like our dressing rooms were downstairs in the basement. So sometimes you're running off stage, you're coming down, it's a fast change. You're, it, you know, you just have to think about, okay, I have to just get my clothes on, <laughs> go back up to do the next scene. So it is, um, it's, it's pretty intense, but you become like a family. And I, and I think that happens no matter what kind of theater production you're in you're you're living with people these people who you work with and so you 
gain tremendous friendships. In fact, uh, I still keep in touch with many of the performers I performed with, and some of them have been gone on to become movie stars and um, or you know assistant directors or directors. Um, the the closeness that you you have just because you're you're spending all these hours together, you 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 gain a life lifetime worth of of friends. It wasn't there a woman lead in Miss Saigon that went on and. I think she was originally from the from the Philippines, if I'm not mistaken, and she became a pretty famous actress. Uh, well, there was Leah Salonga, who was the star of of Miss Saigon, and she's gone on to um, she's an international star, actually. Right. Um, right. Um, and she was originally from the Philippines. Um, but there are other uh, performers who've gone on to do leads in TV shows and movies and um, uh, a dancer uh, who. I actually danced or performed with in Shogun. She's um, she's a pretty well known choreographer now in Broadway shows. So some people um, change careers like I did, uh, but others stay in show business and they continue. Maybe they were dancers, but they became actors, or maybe they were dancers and they became choreographers. So um, it, but it is kind of uh, interesting how. Those years, in fact, we can, you know, if I met them today, I could, I could still, you know, feel that familiar familiarity because we spent so much time together in the show. Let me ask you one more question about the, about the, the field itself. You know, choreographers in New York are very famous for being extraordinarily difficult. Uh, <laughs> did, did you find that to be true or is it, I mean, not difficult in a bad sense, difficult in the sense that you, you, they were very meticulous. Did you find that to be true? Dancing is, um, what I found was that um, actually the choreography, well, the, in, in the shows that I did, of course they were, they were difficult, but it all depended on the vision of the director and the choreographer. So some people were very visual. And so the attention to detail was was um, something that you you had to you had to remember, and they would let you know if you're not if you weren't doing it correctly. Um, in other cases, it was a little more um, there was a little more breathing room. So it depended on the it depended on the vision and also the personality of the choreographer. But yes, I I, I had experiences from both very strict people and. Uh, on the other hand, very liberal people. So um, you have all kinds. One of the questions I wanted to ask you is, you know, there are a lot of young people, well, not a lot, there are some young people in Hawaii who are going to want to aspire to what you have done. Um, they may, you know, um, actually now pursue a career in the arts, you know, whether they're going to Yale Drama School or they're going to NYU um, for whatever reason. But what kind of advice would you give them? Because you you seem to have got there not in a straight line, but through yeah. zigs and zags that just were so lucky. And you know, who would have thought that you went <laughs> to, from Hawaii to Japan and right. then to Broadway? I mean, that's a that's an unusual transition, or at least it seems to be unusual to me. My advice would be if you feel passionate about a particular art, uh, whether it's writing or directing or singing or dancing or acting. And you feel like you have a talent for it, and you feel like you want to pursue studying and developing your own craft. Um, you should go for it, um, knowing that um, it's not going to be easy. I think that you have to be realistic. So I think if I went, if when I was in New York and I saw that I didn't have enough skill or um, I didn't have the emotional uh, wherewithal to withstand all of the competition, I think I would have told, had a hard conversation with myself and told me maybe it's time not to, or maybe it's time to move on to something else. But if you have that passion, like, I think when I was studying dancing or or even singing for that matter, I had the determination 
that I wanted to be better. It was being better, not I want to get a job. Of course, you do want to get a job, but it was like, how can I be, how can I be better? How can I be, how can I be the best I, that I can be? That's kind of what motivated me. And I happened to have lucky breaks along the way. I didn't set a goal of being on Broadway when I got there. I was like, no, I'm going to study dance. This is my passion. I want to learn more. And that led to, um, you know, I, again, my opportunities, the opportunities I encountered led me to get to where I wanted to or eventually get to Broadway. Not saying that you shouldn't have that goal, but it is a difficult goal. So being realistic, but pursuing your passion and understanding that um, it's not a straight line. I don't think it is for anybody. Um, so that's the advice I would give. The hard part in New York now, I think it, compared to my day is I think there is more competition. Um, and it's probably more structured. So for example, I think you can send in auditions through video today. In my day, you couldn't. You had to show up there and then audition in person. So you, you know, if you can submit videos, you're <laughs> I think you, you, you have so many more uh, applicants for the one job. Part of it is while you're studying your craft or or whatever it is, you have to be unique too because they're gonna have to choose you out of the many videos that come in to 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 see if uh, or it's it's going to have to spark somebody's eye that you have something different to offer because they're going to get a zillion um applicants for that one job i i you know i've heard that you know juilliard uh, that when people submit their applications of course they send in videos now too on the on the same angle so um really one of my last questions for you sherry is so you transition and you transitioned from the field in the arts so you became a successful stockbroker um you know in <laughs> Japan you uh basically you know returned to Hawaii and formed an educational coalition um right. you're now working you know um head to head 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 first to, um for you know as a as an administrator in the Department of Education so how did how did this these successful jumps on Broadway and sometimes unsuccessful as you've mentioned um prepare you uh, for these other jobs, and perhaps uh, you know, of course, one could already imagine that you your your strength is uh, internal. But um, uh, how did it prepare you? Um, well, it's funny the um, uh, the the fund manager who hired me for the job uh, investing in the Japanese stock market. Um, although I had an economics degree and I spoke Japanese, and I. Um, I had gotten my master's in business administration, my MBA from the University of Hawaii. I didn't actually have um, experience working for uh, a financial institution. Uh, but when he looked at my resume and he saw <laughs> I'd been on Broadway, he thought, well, if this gal can uh, make it there, he, she can make it anywhere. <laughs> so I was hired because of that, um, partly because of that. Um, so... I think that's just an indication like I I had the perseverance uh to to keep going and um I think no matter what I've done uh since coming back to Hawaii and pursuing different careers um I do have the perseverance I've tried my best to um be better at whatever it is and the discipline and hard work that I applied to studying singing and dancing and just managing that whole show business life really applies to any any um field and position so that taught me a lot um the other is you know getting rejected a lot i mean i kind of do have thick skin it does it doesn't feel good but it doesn't necessarily mean you are bad it just means that you're not the right fit sometimes and so you take that into consideration also um but then the other thing is you know sometimes i have to public speak and um the experience i've had performing is is also very helpful that's like that's a great um it's a great transition and and sherry i would like to thank you uh, for coming on today because you are definitely a broadway person extraordinaire <laughs> and uh so i'd like to thank the most charming um, Shuri Nakamura. But I'd also like to say that in this discussion, 
um, the audience may have noticed that when she was talking about travel in New York City, she said, I'm walking, I'm not taking the bus or I'm not taking the subway. And I was told by my grandmother who owned a flower shop in New York City for over 50 years that real New Yorkers don't take cabs. So, you know, obviously, Sherry, you're also, among many other things, um, being the, the dancer extraordinaire, the, the singer extraordinaire, um, you are a true New Yorker, even though you have come back and live in Hawaii. One last comment I'd like you to make is, I know you're doing some work in the arts, despite your many other jobs <laughs> during your daytime um, in Hawaii. Do you want to describe that a little bit? Because you're, you're continuing with your singing. Right. So I do sing on a cruise uh, that goes from Aloha Tower uh, out. Um, it's a sunset cruise, but on Fridays, we we actually go and see the fireworks at the Hilton. I sing Hawaiian music. Um, um, it's a it's a very relaxing time. And so Hawaiian music is very um, appropriate, I think, for for this kind of relaxing sunset cruise. It's a cocktail cruise. Um, I am also I also sing weddings. Um, there's a huge Japanese wedding industry in Hawaii, and I can use my Japanese as well as uh, sing in Hawaiian and English. Um, I also teach ballet. I still dance. Um, I teach a basic ballet class. So these singing and dancing opportunities um, keep me well-rounded I think um I do have a, a state job now and it's demanding um being in the office all day but having these outlets to be artistic and uh use my skills and talents to um entertain people uh I I I really really value because it's it's a great balance not only that um I've become very close to the entertainers here in Hawaii, I think entertainers, if they're in New York or in Hawaii, it's it, there's common personalities. So we all we all get along and and uh, have a good time. So I, I I treasure that, too. It's been such a pleasure <laughs> to talk to the truly charming and talented uh, Sherry Nakamura. Um, this is Carl Ackerman, host of Journeys of the Mind for Think Tech Hawaii. A hui ho to all. Aloha, aloha.